I didn't want to do the snatch with my left hand because I forgot I had my watch on. <laughs> it goes on, clunk, breaks the watch. I've done that before. Anyway, welcome to True Power Trumpet Fitness on this wonderful Wednesday. Uh, you saw the thumbnail. The Gerard Schwartz, Caleb Hudson connection. All right. Now, we've talked a lot about old school and the new age stuff and how the tone has changed and everything. And I've thought, I've thought about this a lot. It's not necessarily just in the last couple of weeks. I've thought about this a lot. Where, how we got to this point. From in my, in my opinion, the golden age of brass to what we have now. All right? Anyway, let me talk a little bit. I have played quite a bit. Done some kettlebell, been on the bike. I'm ready to go, and uh, we'll see what we got. Gerard Schwartz, Caleb Hudson connection. As far as I know, they never met. Maybe they did, I don't know. But anyway, for those of you young guys, Gerard Schwartz, what, what are you talking about? He's the uh, music director of the Seattle Symphony Orchestra. Has been for a long time. Yep, you're right. Before that, guys, he was principal trumpet of the New York Philharmonic for five minutes. Okay? Now, I was in New York and studying with Vacchiano when that transition happened. And just between me and you, Vacchiano is not thrilled. Schwartz was a student of Vacchiano, okay, at Juilliard. And I don't believe that Vacchiano had any problem with Schwartz personally, as far as I know. I think everything was hunky-dory. But the problem was, is that at that time, Vacchiano, I mean, that was the preeminent job in the music business for a trumpet player. And he didn't think Schwartz deserved it. First of all, his playing was not orchestral. All his, most of his experience was the American Brass Quintet, which is a very, very light, delicate concept. And he had little to no orchestral experience. Now, also, John Ware was there and who has gone to war with Vacchiano. And Vacchiano, I, I mean, nobody, nobody has a problem with John Ware's playing. And Vacchiano thought that he should have gotten that job handed to him without an audition. Well, they made him audition and they gave co-principal to Johnny and Schwartz. Now, Schwartz grew up very, very wealthy. Very wealthy. Not only his parents, grandparents, the whole nine yards. Huge, huge money there. The scuttlebutt was he bought it. But not only because of that and the conducting and everything, Schwartz went on to be very, very much of a power broker in the orchestral world. Very much. Okay? Uh, now, Vacchiano came in. I got two calls from Vacchiano. One I'll save to the end. Vacchiano came in one day, and at that time, I think it was Zubin Mehta was the music director of the Philharmonic at that time. And he had picked out the entire Mahler cycle. 
And we were just going crazy. We were as, as brass players. Ah, oh, because not only, you know, my connection, we all studied with people in the Philharmonic, you know, the tuba player, the bass trombone player, the honor, and we had access to rehearsals. I mean, it was just glorious to go over and listen to this stuff. And you listen to John Ware, you listen to Gerard Schwartz. Okay, huge, huge difference. Now, Jerry Schwartz actually took one lesson with Jerry. And he was playing a Bach 5C, and Jerry had him playing Fs and Gs that, you know, lead players would have been proud of. He got all through with the hour lesson, and he says, look, Jerome, I understand what you're doing, but that is just not the, the sound that I'm after. He said, and I don't know where this came from, all I care about is the five feet around me in the orchestra. That's the brass quintet mentality. All right, and Jerry said, "Well, what about the guys that are paying X amount of dollars that's sitting in the back row?" Didn't have an answer for that, and Jerry told him before I left, "Jerry, I wish you well, but you're going to go out on your shield." Vacchiano came in a couple days later, and said, "Schwartz isn't going to make it through the Mahler cycle. He doesn't have the chops." Sure enough, he didn't, and he did not get tenure. Thus, being began his conducting career. Okay, now, how do we get to Caleb Hudson? Mark Gould, who was the assistant principal to uh, Mel for many, many years in the, the Metropolitan Opera, studied with Gerard Schwartz and was an advocate, an absolute disciple of that light quintet type of playing which couldn't have been any different opposite of Broyles. Broyles hated him for many reasons that I won't get into, and some are absolutely disgusting on Mark Gold's case, but that's, I'm going to my grave with that. Um, and again, Mel couldn't understand how this guy got the job. Like Schwartz, he had no credentials of major orchestra playing anywhere. And Mel, for the power thing, did not consider him a top player, okay? Where's Caleb Hudson come in? I'm leaving a link down below. Caleb Hudson studied with Mark Gould at Juilliard. Now listen to this. Now we have been talking the last couple of weeks, guys. It started uh, with Maurice playing Gershwin and he sounded like Harry James, remember that? That high F on a C trumpet? Mon homme. Then so much stuff on Doc and we, you know, Gazzo playing that, uh, oh my God, that's what I'm listening to. And you listen to this and you see what I'm talking about. This is exactly what I'm talking about and how that town changed from the golden age of brass to what we're hearing today. And you listen to Caleb Hudson, you listen to uh, Chris Martin, you listen to uh, Bilger, you listen to that guy uh, Inoue out in San This is how they play. Now listen guys, I do believe that it got there via Gerard Schwartz. He had the Philharmonic locked up for a short amount of time. Then he was one of the power brokers, conductors worldwide. And he was taking this type of person to play for him up in Seattle. It was, uh, maybe it wasn't Seattle, doesn't matter. I do believe that is where it all started. And his students, Mark Gould, whatever, start teaching other students. And before you know it, Mel Broyles is a distant memory. And what do we have? We have Caleb Hudson. Now listen, listen, and listen carefully. He is a wonderful player, a technical marvel, a technical marvel. I am not knocking his technique anyway. The sound is not what I'm after. Now, I guarantee you, if he were to listen to one of these videos, he'd think I was a barbarian. That's not what he's after either. It's just a different thing. It's not for me, 
but I can't, I'm not going to say can't be for you. If that's what you want, go for it. Okay? But you're going to hear a couple things. There's no power. None. The tone is not centered. It's fluffy. And uh, there's no pop whatsoever. Which means his tongue position isn't even the same room as what we're doing. Okay? It's obviously on the lower, anchored to the lower oral cavity. <sighs> Completely different thing. Okay? I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying I'm a better trumpet player than him. I'm not saying that he's not a good trumpet player. It's a different thing. Give me Gazo. All right? Now, I told you I was going to end with a quote, another quote from Vacchiano. And he said this very much under his breath when he told me that he didn't think Schwartz was going to last the motorcycle. Okay? He said... If you want to sound like a flute, play the damn flute. Couldn't say it better myself. <laughs> All right, Caleb, carry on. I'm sure you don't give two squats about what I think of you. You shouldn't because I, I think you're tremendous for what you do. The sound doesn't work for me. Subjective, potato, potato. All right? All right, guys. Drinking your smoothies, drinking your juice. Love you all.